You wrote that? I didn't steal. I stole it. Dang, oh. I didn't. I wrote it down <laughs> yes. for sure. Did you sign it? <laughs> Hey, welcome back, guys. We are on episode 24, so that means we're almost halfway through, and we're just now getting into the epistles. And so we're starting with Paul's letter to the Romans. And what's cool here is a couple things, just to start off in terms of context for Romans. Uh, Paul, at this point, hadn't really even been to Rome. You know, he's going to be at some point. We saw that in Acts, but he's not been to Rome. And so these are really the people that he talks about. You know, some of them may just be strangers that have heard about him or he's he's heard about. And then if you want to put it in more context, then my understanding is that Nero, by the time he's writing this, Nero, 16-year-old Nero, had, had just recently taken the throne and emperor of Rome. Mm-hmm. And so we all know what Nero's like. <laughs> yeah. And uh, later on, part of what's happened here too. So within the Romans, you know, the, the Jewish believers, they would have been pushed out by Claudius and, um, you know, blamed with the fire and all that type of stuff later. But um, when they're coming back, you know, about five years later, then then the church is very Gentile-ish. Sure. And so this is probably, probably part, part of what Paul is responding to. Um, you know, you got these Jewish people that are saying Sabbath and circumcision and all this type of stuff. Certain foods are good. Certain foods are bad. And uh, the Gentiles are like, well, no, I mean, we're free. We were, all, we were doing just fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so Romans along with Galatians, if you were to, if you wanted to read Galatians along with Romans, right. then you could do that. And uh, both of them are very heavy on law versus grace and that whole idea and the transition of, and really I, transition is probably the wrong word just because it was always going to be grace as we're going to see there in verse or in it's chapter a transition one. Transition of understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess that's probably our lead in in terms of just the whole idea of Paul's going to talk about the law and he's going to talk about how the law was never there to say, yes, this is the way that somebody is saved. Right. So let's jump in. Um, Pastor Randall covered some of it in terms of uh, one through seven on in, in the sermon. But I did want to mention just in verse in verses one and two, as far as one of the things that stuck out to me is that Paul, when he's introducing himself, set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel that he promised beforehand through the prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was a descendant and so on that Paul is seeing his purpose, like his purpose as an apostle, the fact that he was called out beforehand, he's seeing that in the bigger picture of, of God's plan. Mm -hmm. And yet there's, there's a lot of beauty in that, if you will. Like if I wanted to roll that into today, then how am I seeing my, you know, we, we get so hung up on what is God's purpose for my life? What is God's will for my life? And more than anything else, I think we need to understand that God, any, any portion of that, (laughs) is going to be in the bigger picture of God's plan for salvation. So yeah. salvation for us, salvation for the ones we reach, all that type of stuff. Anybody out there <clears throat> looking for a, a preaching outline for the first seven, it's the prophecy, the proof, and the purpose. And so you, know, you got your write that down. <laughs> but, it, but it wasn't good enough for you to use. I didn't use that one. You're right. So <laughs> like next time. <laughs> it's just, and I said it, you know, even having preached through the first seven verses and Trying to be very thorough, but still, there's so much you can't hit, so much you can't can't discuss. It, uh, mm-hmm. We could have talked about more of the prophecies, you know, and and more of the proofs, and and even more of the purposes for that matter. But it can only go so far in a 30 minute sermon. What I like is that is the guy um, Paul is setting the stage here. This is all about the gospel, you know, his right. life, the this book, the mission, all of it is about the gospel. Even the prophets beforehand, it was all about the gospel, and so it, uh, it's the beautiful part of it that. It puts us kind of back center to here's what it is truly all about for us and from us. Well, and I like to, in verse four, in terms of he points out that the resurrection from the dead, the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to see how that is what gives not just the cross, but also the resurrection is what gives Jesus the authority and the power and all that to be the judge. So it's not right. only our redemption, but it's also the way that he can judge. So we'll see that. We see it in first Corinthians when we, when we get there too, but just the reminder, the constant reminder that we need that the resurrection is, is the difference maker. It's the key to all of it. Yep. So I want to back up, just mm. back up to slave or bond servant mm. or servant for Paul's whole life before <gasps> meeting Christ. He was a slave to the law um, and a slave to the Jewish customs. And until um, he had that encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, he became now that bond servant to Jesus Christ. And I like how you kind of put that in perspective for everybody on Sunday, that it was a, it's a willingness. Like you sell yourself into servitude because you know that this master is going to be good to you. Mm -hmm. That's also what I see throughout Romans kind of clarifying that the law, there's no reason to be a slave to the law. We have a new 
master that we can serve, and that is um, the person of Jesus Christ, and he gives us everything that we need. So Yeah, and the power of God to even orchestrate all of it together right. to <laughs> say that the law was Jesus being the fulfillment of the law. Mm-hmm. And so by following Jesus, by living according to Jesus and all that, then we are fulfilling the law. Yeah. Um, not in the perfection that would gain salvation, but in the aspect of uh, just yeah, following through with the law and obedience. And, and Paul writes it. We're going to get to it in a second. He says it all comes into clearer focus once you realize that it's all about the gospel of Jesus Christ and grace, mm-hmm. salvation through mm-hmm. faith by grace. And then the law really makes sense then. Before that, it was kind of skewed. If you didn't understand that here's where it was going yeah. or here's its purpose, then it became something that it was never supposed to be. And that's what happened with the Jewish people. It became the, the standard of salvation rather than the standard that tells them that they needed salvation. <laughs> yeah, right. When we get to verse 8, we see a common theme throughout all of Paul's letters in terms of when he's writing to these people, he loves them. And he's like, you know, I loved you to the point of sharing the gospel with you. Like that's the motivating factor. (laughs) Like I loved you and I I wanted to share the gospel, but also that he thanks God for these people. He thanks God for their, the fact that they are faithful. He thanks God for the fact that God is still working, like that he's thanking God for the work that God is doing in them and so on and so forth. And so uh, just a couple highlights within that. As I was reading this, I realized too, you know, Paul for the church, um, he was famous. I mean, this is this guy. Yeah. Everybody knew about Paul. I mean, even, yeah. even the demons like, I know about Paul now. <laughs> you I've not heard about, but Paul, yeah, got him. Mm-hmm. So he really was uh, a person of notoriety. It, uh, we don't like to use the word Christian celebrity because, you know, we avoid those type of ideas. But the reality was he would have been so well known and mm-hmm. uh, highly thought of, even particularly in the Gentile world. That uh, whenever you received a letter from Paul, man, this had to mean something. I mean, right. This was yeah. a big, big deal, top shelf stuff. Like, oh, Paul wrote us a letter. <laughs> and uh, not only did he write it, within that, he's just so so gooey here. I liked it. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I love well, you guys. I was like, well, and oh, he, did, Piccadilly. <laughs> he didn't even found this church. This was right. a, a church that he, yes. you know, it wasn't on his, one of his journeys, obviously, because he longs to go there. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, he says that their their faith has been known about throughout the world and so he's heard about them and they're probably ecstatic that he's heard about them and now he's communicating with them and he wants to um impart some kind of spiritual gift to them Mm -hmm. and um i'm sure that's super encouraging and paul uses it's not like he's going to go and lay hands on and they're going to get the you know the spiritual gifts the gifts of the spirit that like the evidence of the holy spirit type stuff this is like more of hey i want to go and and be with you so that we are both edified together, right. you know, in unity in the Holy Spirit, and that it would build us up, yeah. essentially. Yeah. So. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was going to say in terms of the the mutual strengthening. Yeah. That if we go into, you know, anywhere basically, <laughs> that it's not uh, us ministering to people, but we're understanding that there's a mutual strengthening, especially within the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. That that is a good, more humble approach to go into any situation to say, it's not like I'm going to come in and I'm going to impart some sort of knowledge to you, or I'm going to, you know, encourage you with some sort of gifts or some sort of celebrity or whatever it might be. It's more a matter of, listen, I mean, we're part of the body of Christ. And in the same way that we're all saved, the the foot of the cross is level ground type idea. Then we've got something to offer each other to. Paul's not coming in and saying, you know what, I'm it. And so I get to teach you guys. (laughs) And he reveals his humility in verse 14. Like, look, I'm indebted. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I am a debtor to everybody uh, yeah. because I'm a nobody who God has saved, basically. But uh, I'm coming because I owe this to you, not because I'm going to you know, be your celebrity. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And so in verse 16 and following, we get the um, what most people would say, this is the outline or this is the motivation for the for the message of Romans. That Paul is saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel, and this is one of those things that we claim <laughs> that mm. this is the boldness that we need. We we need not to be ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to anybody who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. And so then we also get to the righteous, the righteousness by faith, where the righteous by faith will live, and uh, those two aspects I think are are key. You know, these are the key verses. Yeah. Oh man. <clears throat> How long we got here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we parked a bus and, you know, this is where we leave it, then this is where we leave it. All right. I started thinking, like, what would even be a reason for Paul to be ashamed of the gospel? Mm. And it really comes down to, and you can actually see it throughout Acts. When you start preaching a resurrection, people scoff at you. Yes. There's, what proof do you have, man, that, you know, this guy has even risen from the dead? And, you know, they're in Asia, and this is told right. about in Jerusalem, so there's, you know, distance. And so... 
there's that aspect. Like, obviously, people could laugh at you. And then I started thinking about, you know, what about in our time? Like, why would we be ashamed of the gospel? And I think the what it boils down to is it's countercultural now. Um, there was a time when, like, at least the United States was majority, at least accepting of Christianity. Now it's not as much. Well, and Christianity was seen as a moral thing. At yeah, least. it was like, a, yeah, any, if you had any morals in the United States, it was probably based in the Christian faith. And so now we're kind of seeing the tables flip and it's been very recent, I think. Yeah, past 20 years. Yeah. So there's there's reason for, for people growing up now to be ashamed of the gospel because no one is is even proclaiming it out loud. And if you are a Christian out in the real world and you're out, <laughs> we're blessed because we are, you know, surrounded by brothers and sisters all the time because we're, we work in a church, but there are other people that don't, that don't work in a church. And so, um, you know, maybe they're suppressing the gospel because they're afraid of how they get looked at, or maybe they're going to be, um, you know, made fun of or put down on, or even restricted in their, their rights. Um, you know, it could be any of that. There's, there's a multitude of reasons why you could be ashamed of the gospel. No good ones. Right. Yeah. No good ones. <laughs> Excuses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but what I like is that Paul is, Paul is saying that he's not ashamed because it is the power of God um, for salvation. Mm. Yeah. And, that's and so the, that's what we have to, to lean on too. Yeah, like, the motivation. It's, it's God's power. It's not even our power. Like we don't have anything to do with it. Yeah, so... If I don't remember, I don't know if you remember at camp, but they they had mentioned a quote. I can't remember if it was Spurgeon or whoever, but anyway, it was essentially, and I'm going to butcher it, paraphrase it here, but <laughs> it was essentially like we don't have the motivation and and the the gumption, I guess, the boldness to preach the gospel because we don't see either one that we we've not we don't see our own salvation as such a great a thing, mm-hmm. you know, like our sin. We don't see it, you know, as heavy as it should be or in the right light. But the other aspect may be that we don't share the gospel because we don't see hell as a very real thing. Mm. And so people going to hell. And so this idea of, you know, it's the power of God for salvation. If we believe that people, that hell is a re- very real place and people are going there, then that motivates us to share the gospel. And yeah. uh, and I think that that's, that's part of it. If we have these temptations to be ashamed of the gospel, if we see the bigger picture and we see, man, what's at stake here, then the shame goes away. And we're willing to we're, we're willing to sacrifice whatever it may be pride, uh, reputation, uh, being seen as stupid or unreasonable, less less moral than the world around us even, <laughs> which is a crazy thought, but it is definitely true in today's world. Yeah, it's um, I got lots of places we could go with this particular passage. It's uh, <laughs> Romans ten. You know, how can they believe if they don't hear? How can they hear if we don't preach? Right. So and it uh, and and some of this for me clears up some of the mystery of salvation it, uh, because there are still some mysterious ways about it, right? You know, the, the call, the elect, the chosen, the, you know, how's all of that work out and the gospel and our, you know, responsibility to share it. And so I, this passage helps clear it up for me that, you know, God has embedded his power into this message. I was like, well, mm. where are they called? Where they are now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's, let's don't make it too complicated. It's, uh, you share, but, and, and this is how I'm seeing it. You know, whenever you put that message out there, it goes with the power of God in it that does miraculous stuff every time it encounters humankind. It's, it does miracles. And so you want to see the miracle of salvation. It's already tied up to the gospel. And so if we will get it out there, if we will share it, then we get to see God's miraculous power. And if we don't, then, you know, we we limit our ability to see God do miracles. Yeah. And that kind of goes into the following passage of what the, you know, as Paul is building this case all the way leading up to chapter 12, you know, he says that the wrath of God is revealed uh, from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. And so we have this idea Paul is getting back to, you know, when people say, oh, well, I believe that mankind is good. Obviously, we understand from Scripture that that's not the case. We all have a sin nature. We're all born in sin. We are all blind. We are all darkened. And so it's that it's that Acts 28 reference of Isaiah that we just looked at in terms of, uh, you know, that seeing we will, we will not see and right. perceiving we will not hear and that type of thing, not understand. And so we've got... This idea, God has revealed himself in creation. God has revealed himself through all the different things that he has done. And so there's this conscience that we have, but yet it's so easy for us and within our sin nature to, to, to deny that. 
and to cover it up and to um, believe a lie, which then makes the truth seem false. So like when you believe right. a lie, then whatever is the truth that is conflicting to that, then now that truth seems to be false. And so when we encounter people, then that's basically what we're seeing. And especially as we get into like all the different things that he lists and a few verses later, basically, then these are things you can't, you can't have all these things. <laughs> you can't be doing all these things and, and believe, oh yeah, God is, God is good and God is real and salvation is there. Yeah. Back on to verse 17, I was, you know, thinking about well, what does it mean that the righteousness of, not, righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel? Yeah. And I came to like basically three conclusions. So, you know, those who preach all the time, I like this. <laughs> this <is> three points. <laughs> Are they alliterated? No, they're oh, not because I don't. Mess. I mean, they all have the word right in them because it's talking about righteousness. Junk. <laughs> it is okay. junk. No. You can do the alliteration yourself. All right, I'm on it. <laughs> Let's hear this. Well, we know that the righteousness of God is also found in the person of Jesus Christ. That's bonus. It's not even in this. But the person of Jesus Christ proves to us uh, that, that God is right. Yeah. And so that's number one. In the power of the gospel, um, it shows that God is right. That's what is revealed. Number two, um, what else is revealed is that it shows us how to be right. And essentially what that means is that we're actually going to get into it. So maybe I won't even go into it. <laughs> the proof I'll, I'll wait. in the person, the, the power in the person, oh my goodness. the prescription to be the person. <laughs> yeah. The, the number three is it empowers us to be right. Yeah. Um, so the gospel shows us that God is right, shows us that um, we are not right and how to be right. And then it gives us the power to be right. Mm. That is the, the way that God's righteousness is revealed. And when we get to verse 18, like Michael was saying, we see how God's wrath is now revealed I in, bet, in the unrighteousness. I bet when Paul was writing this, he was writing it thinking, man, there are going to be so many three-point sermons here. <laughs> <come out of." laughs> he never wrote one. You can believe that. <laughs> uh, his sermons went on forever. Like, yeah. this is, what is the point, Paul? <laughs> his, I like right. Paul just because his sentences go on forever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, He's that? like... You almost hear him saying in his mind, he's like, and another thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I hear him saying, diagram this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and another, I got another thing. <laughs> it ends with that, that sentence with from faith to faith or from first to last, meaning mm -hmm. that through our entire sanctification process, these are the things that the gospel is going to be doing for us. Continuing to show us that God is right, shows us how to be right and gives us the power from the beginning to the end, how to be right. And that links up well with yeah. Timothy. First Timothy three fifteen, the word of God, God so, breathed and good for, for yeah. grace yeah. and instruction, righteousness. So as we get into, like we mentioned, the the remainder of chapter one, faith and truth often have this tight relationship. Um, obedience has a tight relationship mm -hmm. with all all these things that you know. Obviously, we it comes up a lot when we're preaching and stuff because they have such a tight relationship. When we are, when we don't have faith, then yeah, we're going to deny the truth. We're going to not believe the truth. We're not going to live by the truth, and so it's not going to show up in obedience and so many other things along those lines. And so the the main reason why I bring it up is because I want people listening to to be aware of that as we're going through and see how many times it shows up in terms of truth related to faith and and when you don't have faith, then that's your mind is darkened and you start believing lies and all that type of stuff. And so, yeah, keep that in mind as we go. This um, last phrase there in verse 17, the righteous by faith will live, or the and righteous will live by faith. You know, mm -hmm. different versions kind of changed it <laughs> up. Yeah. But um, for our, our listeners, at least, all, all three or four of you, it's, <laughs> um, I just want to spend just a second on that because uh, what, what does it mean? I think there's some, a couple of meanings within this that, you know, are some are obvious, but the reality is that to be righteous it starts with faith, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not just that there's a, a working out, but there's a working in. So the righteousness begins with faith, this trusting that, you know, my way was wrong and your way is right, God. And mm -hmm. spe specifically with this culture and these people, uh, even more specifically with the Jewish people. Uh, but with the Greeks also, the the Gentiles, you know, they, they were basically living life either idolatrously or without any regard whatsoever. So they had to come to some conclusion that, hey, my way was wrong. And there is a different way. And so I'm going to trust God's way. And so there's that faith reality where the righteousness is in, in bestowed upon us. But then there's also the obedience path that you were talking about where the, the righteous, not only made righteous because they've chosen to trust God by faith, but they are 
indicated as righteous because they're living by faith. And so mm-hmm. there's uh, the working in and the working out, you know, where we're, it's a, it's, a, it's a trust life. This life of faith is a trust life where we just say, you know, that God's way is better than my way. His, his word is more relevant than my wants. And, uh, and his instructions are better for me than my intellect. And uh, where we continue to choose him over us in, in all of these areas. And that's what the faith life looks like for those who are righteous. Yeah. So as we move into 18, like we said, you know, the wrath of God and is coming and being shown. And, and it's really all about the people that are suppressing the truth and what the things that suppressing truth leads to. And so this is, we understand it as a same nature that we've been imputed with. We understand that it's not just that, but it's also our own rebellion as we, as we choose it within our free agency. So in 19, when he, he talks about how all things, what can be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain. This is common grace. And we, you know, if, if you guys haven't heard this before, then understand that there is a, there's an amount of grace that God has shown to everyone that we call it special or it's like general revelation versus special revelation or common grace versus specific. It's this idea that, you know, we can look around in creation and I say this all the time and I probably even said this on the podcast before, but I tell the kids, man, if you feel like you're far away from God, then sometimes you need to get away from man-made things. You need to actually spend some time thinking, man, there's a God of the universe out here. Mm-hmm. Look up at the stars, mm-hmm. be in creation, take a walk, you know, those, those types of things. If you're out mm-hmm. at the ocean, one of the things that we marvel at is just how powerful the ocean is. You mentioned the, the Leviathan, or no, it was that camp, the Le- Leviathan. Mm-hmm. Um, and we spent some time talking about that. And it's like this magnificent, huge, huge beast. And of course the guy was like, do you believe in dragons? That's kind of how he <laughs> brought it up. But, um, you know, there's this idea of this we huge, in dragon huge, breath. <laughs> <laughs> Huge beast, but God is, he's, he's over it all. Yeah. And, uh, and it points to somebody that is over it all. I would probably make the argument that at our core, you know, if we were to, our default position would to believe in some sort of divine creator. That's what it's telling us. Right. Yeah. His right. eternal power and his divine nature has been able to be seen in creation. And so if you don't have influence of anything else, then we would at least come to the conclusion of there's got to be something bigger. There's mm-hmm. got to be something over all of this. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's taken so. a lot of time to come up with any other theory <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that is even a workable option, even though it's, it's obviously not. And that's only been in recent years. And so most of society moving in reverse has agreed, yes, there is a God, a creator. Yeah. Now, they didn't necessarily respect it or even get it right, but they had some understanding of, yeah, we believe that there's and something bigger. I yeah. saw it. I was, I was going to say, I, I was reading in one of one commentator put it this way, that, you know, since the creation of the world, mankind generally thought monotheistic, yes. you know, they worshiped the Lord, yeah. the one true God. And then as people grew, <clears throat> they became polytheistic. polytheistic. <clears throat> and now, you atheistic. know, since in the <laughs> modern age, now we're into the, the atheistic, which, yeah. you know, there's no God at all. Which, so. which has well, been a recent advent. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. because ultimately what it really boils down to is if we, years. yeah, if we want to be humanistic, then you cannot be, right. you know, theistic if you're humanistic. That's right. Yeah. They don't match. They do not. And Equally, so, mutually exclusive. You're right. Yeah. And so it brings us back then to verse 20, where people are without excuse, no matter what your belief is. Yeah. You know, no matter what you grew up thinking yeah. or, or reading or believing or, or parents or grandparents, you're going to be without excuse, which to some degree, it puts us all on equal footing. And I like that. I stood, this is when I've got time for stories. I stood up and this is when I was in college, man. They asked me to teach a Sunday school class at my home church. And it was a large uh, room of people and it was adults. I'm like, okay, I'll, I can do this. I was nervous. And so I began with this from, I was pre- teaching from Romans. And I began with the question, if somebody in the middle of the rainforest had never heard of Jesus in their whole life, never been exposed to the Bible, the gospel, they died, where would they spend eternity? And about 90% got it wrong. Mm. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> so then it got real awkward. <laughs> it's like, well, um, let's think about it like this. <laughs> it was like, I'm not a good oh, punk, teen, uh, punk uh, college kid trying to tell them that they're wrong, and they're like, you know, middle aged. He, age, he came in with his revolver strapped to <laughs> yeah, waist. Like, like, start, uh, like, so then I came shooting. back to this passage that they are without excuse. It doesn't matter what your excuse might be. Oh, I never heard. That's the yeah, honor. There's you, no you're without ignorance. Without excuse. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Without means you have none. And it's uh and so we have to I think embrace that and I love the fact that Paul is starting now this path with that. So we'll go ahead and get that out of the way. Because there's not going to be any excuses. I'm going to give you some truths here and there's no recourse by way of, you know, 
arguing your way out of this. And he even comes back to that in a few minutes. There's no excuse for not knowing about God because it's been revealed. Yeah. I, so the knowledge, though, what is the extent of their knowledge then? You know, in verse 21, although they knew God, they did not glorify him or give thanks. They became futile in their thoughts and senseless. Then their senseless hearts were darkened. And one of the things that I wrote down was a, just a question of what's the extent of their knowledge, like through all of that. Obviously, it seems like, you know, we get from this, we get the impression that it is at least enough to convict and condemn. Yeah. So I, I just wrote down how many times <laughs> Paul said that they knew. It's they su- they suppress the truth, so they, there's one. They knew that what the truth was, and they suppressed it. God shown them the evidence. That's two. His eternal and divine, or eternal power and divine nature had been clearly seen. That's three. And then four. They knew God, but they didn't glorify Him. And then number five. They exchanged His glory. So they knew His glory, but they swapped it out. Mm-hmm. So I don't know to what extent it it went, but. Obviously, it was far enough to where they knew that they were trading it for something else. Yeah, and I think that that's I'm, one of those things that I'm not... I, yeah, <laughs> when, I don't, as I'm writing this down, I know that I'm not going <laughs> to come up with an answer that's going to be like, okay, this is it. But I do wonder, you know, to what extent. Like, so if we take, if we strip away, again, all nature versus nurture, all that type of stuff, mm-hmm. and we just have baseline humanity obviously there's a lot of people out there that believes that humanity when you strip it all down people are naturally good Mm, we understand from scripture that our sin nature says that is not the case Mm -hmm. we are prone to wander we're prone to sin we're prone to rebel all of that um we can see what's about to happen when we suppress Mm -hmm. the truth Mm -hmm. but yeah to what extent is that knowledge and and certainly it seems to be enough to that we should respond in, in glory and honor and, and seeking immortality is, is essentially what is mentioned later on yeah. that those who seek glory and seek, you know, honor and seek immortality. And I, I see that as obviously related to God and the one who is worthy of glory right. and honor and so forth. So anyway, I'm kind of rambling now. But I think <laughs> as, as we suppress it, the discovery of it obviously gets more difficult. And so not right. just individually, but I think generationally mm-hmm. it becomes a, a, everything gets foggier because we have had generations of people now suppressing <clears throat> truth. And so, you know, we're growing up in a society where discovering truth is becoming more a more difficult item, particularly, you know, when we're talking about biblical truth. Hmm. It's not so yeah. easily done. You've really got to, to, to shake and bake now to, to find that even within churches on occasion, it's, it, which is a, an awful reality, but uh, that does no good not to say it. I think he kind of gives the progression here. Like, you know, it starts with suppressing truth, but then in the end it ends with exchanging God's glory for the glory of um, mortal things. things. Yeah, Yeah. yeah, created things. Which is idolatry. Right. Yeah. Which is how we're all born. Exactly. We're all born idolaters, and, you know, most of us, it just, it's internal, right? We we love ourselves more than anything or anybody, and so we worship us, and then the if that's never corrected, then it grows into all sorts of things. Well, so perhaps we, we can take even the fall of Satan as as an example. So you've got, um, you know, obviously angels are different than humans and the way that we've been created in the image of God and all that. But in verse 22, it says, although they claim to be wise, they became fools. And the only reason why I'm related in this, the two together is because the fall of Satan was revolving around his pride, mm-hmm. that he wanted to be God. And so... What I wrote down in my notes is arrogance breeds ignorance Mm. and that whole idea of when we are arrogant or when we seek to think like we think, oh, I I already know or I'm I'm already I've already arrived or something like that. You're not teachable. Right. You're not growing. Mm -hmm. You're not seeking to understand somebody's perspective. You're not seeking to understand, Okay, well, is there an area where I'm wrong? You know, so putting it in terms of uh, relational, you know, if if you're coming against me and I'm I've got an arrogant attitude, then I'm going to think, well, everything's your fault. Mm hmm. I'm not going to be open to seeing what what I may have done wrong. And so all of that, you're not going to have any understanding. And so the arrogance, claiming to be wise, they became fools. And then comes the exchange in the glory of the immortal God for images, you know, created things, man, beast. Yeah. And so since this is the way that they have been, he picks up in verse 24 with, so therefore God handed them over, or this version says God gave them over mm-hmm. to their desires. Because they have, they did the first move. They exchanged God's glory first, and so mm-hmm. 
God then just handed them over to their desires. Well, and I think that'll be important when we get a little bit later into Paul's argument when he says, you know, is God just and, and still condemned? Right, right. So yeah, let's let's look at some of the <laughs> some of the ramifications, some of the outworkings of when we exchange the truth of God for a lie, and when we exchange the image of God, glorifying God for just man made things, we start worshiping and serving the creation rather than the creator. And so in verse 26 and, and later, so he starts off by saying, God gave them over to dishonorable passions. And so it starts off with the whole idea of uh, sexual passions, homosexual passions, homosexual acts. And so when people try to draw the lines of, okay, well, why is homosexuality wrong? And all the different twisting of scriptures or reinterpretation of words or whatever, this is one of the clearest passages that we still go to to, to understand it's hard to get around this. It's hard to get around what is natural and what is unnatural when we're talking about sex and sexual relations and everything. And so let's put that out there. But if people are also wondering and questioning, okay, well, is it wrong to, to have like this attraction, like same sex attraction or whatever, I would put it at the very least, what we know from scripture is the act and the lust. Right. Those are, those are wrong. Yeah, I mean, lust in general is wrong. passion. Yeah. Yeah. And then the acts as well, but we'll we'll obviously move on to the rest of them too. So there there is an honorable passion. I think I think uh, the desire to be with someone of the opposite sex is God given. That's honorable. That's natural. Now it can cross lines, obviously, yes. whenever it becomes a fixation, a lust issue type thing. But uh, that's uh, it's not a dishonorable desire. Yeah, it, it's 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 honorable. But so we're talking about this not which means worthless or without value. This is not not a good thing. Mm -hmm. And I've and I've told people before when it comes to the issue of homosexuality, you cannot find one positive instance in the Bible that it's discussed. It's, it's, every time it's ever mentioned, it's negative. And so we've had had all these people try to reinterpret words to try to twist things to make it sound well. No, here's what it meant, and they were they were talking about idolatry. Yeah, it was it wasn't, abusive. It was, yeah, yeah. Right, it was right. coming up. No, it's showing me one <clears throat> positive reference. None, zero. Every time it's referenced, it's negative. And uh, obviously not true with uh, heterosexual relationships. That's plenty of plenty of positive references. And so the the point is that you know we we are given over. That's part of it too. The fact that when you're starting with the basis and and you see all these other things that are listed too that we're going to get into, then understand that these are all categorically against the will of God that that, that happen when you exchange the glory of God for a lie. Uh, the truth of God. And so we have these, I wrote them down just as a list. I'm going to rattle through them. Um, unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, gossips. We become gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil. That's interesting to me. Like, you know, one of the things that we do is we seek ways of inventing new evil. Mm. We're disobedient to our parents. We're foolish. We're faithless. We're heartless and we're ruthless. That covers a lot. Yeah. Do you guys pick up the three point sermon in this one? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get there on this I'd one. I'd have to work a little uh, bit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, the progression is, you know, he first, God gave them up to their desires, which um, their di the desires could be, you know, just their temptations. He gave them up to them and they worshiped the creator rather than the creator. That was shown in verse uh, 23. Mm -hmm. And then after he gave them up to their desires, he gave them up to their passions which is then their conceived desires, which equals sin. It's the rebellion against God's design, right. which we see, you know, why he's listing homosexuality. And then lastly, a depraved mind. He gave them up to a depraved mind, which is, you know, essentially all unrighteousness, which is that list that you guys just listed off. Yeah. And it equals death. It's filled with all kinds of evil, just um, to the point of ignoring God's just sentence and praising those who do those things. Yeah. And so there's my little... Yeah. Well, Three point sermon from there. And <laughs> so, yeah, there's there's a couple things within this, too, that we we need to make sure that we mention. One is the way that he ends it is not only are they the ones doing them, but they also approve of the ones who practice right. them. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, when we're trying to figure out, OK, well, how is scripture relevant to today or how do we see it? We're obviously seeing that today. Yeah, we are. it's not just people that are doing them, but we need we need to approve of other people that are doing them as well. And yep. then the other thing that I would mention, too, is just, man. Can we stop and think and let it weigh on us just that whole idea of when we exchange the truth of God for a lie, that 
when we're looking to all these things and we think that these things are what is good or what are honorable or somehow we've gotten to this point where we feel like we are more enlightened or we are better moral people that are more loving, more accepting, more tolerant, what have you. And that is seen as the higher thing. It's a straight up lie. Yeah. You know, that when we see what God is doing and Jesus being able to judge us and being able to put this truth out there, then we've got to submit to that. And, uh, man, I mean, this is high stakes. Let's put it that way. Well, and the the faith life of the righteous that he talked about over in in verse 17 is agreeing with God Mm -hmm. over society, over our own passions, over over our loved ones. And so particularly when we hit the subject of homosexuality, it impacts everybody because there's not, I don't know anybody that doesn't know somebody. And there's a lot of people even within our church or community that would have someone of of that persuasion, if you want to use those words, close family member. And so Mm -hmm. when we hit homosexuality, it is a, it's a dividing line because it's a point where somebody has to choose either I'm going to agree with God or I'm going to go this other path, which is just easier. And let's be honest, it is easier. Yeah. It's easier just to say, hey, you know what? Love is love, and you do you, and you know everything is okay. But it's not right. And, uh, well, and so- can we put it out there, too, that uh, <clears throat> there's right now there's actually some conflict within the LGBTQIA plus oh, hold community. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that, felt, that felt made up right there. A, B, C, D, e, it's, it's not. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, but there's some because, you know, in order to be a lesbian or to be a gay man or something like that, then then there's definitions within that. And so now with the transgender and all this other stuff, and there's even these, you know, people that are going even further, um, you know, we're starting to see not just homosexual passions, but passions for other things. Um, there's bestiality. There's... Oh, yeah. um, there's nuances of pedophilia. I know that that's a hot button issue and people that are against homosexuality often want to jump to that. So I, there's a part of me that doesn't even want to mention it just because it, you know, if anybody's watching and they're already like, okay, well they're, they're just lumping us in with this side, but there are some of those things. And so the people within that are saying, well, you know, for me to live my life and and to have rights and to be seen as legitimate and all that type of stuff, then it's hard to have all this other stuff over here that's that's fighting against what they're fighting for. And it's interesting to me, and interesting is probably the really wrong word, but this is what we could expect really when it comes down to it. Right. Because it is all, when you're buying into a lie or when you're buying, it, buying into falsehood, then there's going to be conflict. There's going to be confusion. There's going to be you know, what is really right and what's not and, and how do we be tolerant, so to speak, but then... There's obviously things that you're not tolerant of, you know, all sorts of things. We've got to have a standard, right? And that's what God has given us in terms of truth, you know. So, yeah, I like what it says in verse 28. It says that they did not see fit to acknowledge God, and I think the CSB says that they did not find it worthwhile, mm. which means that they didn't think that God was worth their time and not important to them, and you know, God was the least of their concerns. Essentially, when you exchange the truth of God for a lie, this is where you end up not even acknowledging God. Yeah. So, well, and this, this might be a good time to transition to where Paul goes because lest we look at this and be like, man, thank God I am not this, that, and the other. Paul says, therefore you are without excuse. He's saying you, he's not saying they, right. He's saying you. And he says, whoever you are, (laughs) when you judge someone else for what on whatever grounds you judge another, You condemn yourself because you practice the same things. And so we need to see that, you know, okay, so let's even just use the homosexuality thing again. It may not be, and I've had these conversations with people when they're talking to me about homosexuality and and their own desires, like, like they are coming out and that type of thing. Then it's like, okay, well, I may not understand it from your perspective of, of whatever we're talking about in terms of your passions and all that. And, and how does this work? And did God make me this way, this type of thing? I can't understand it in a heterosexual term. Sure, though, right. You know, and that lust is lust. Yeah. And that there's a realm, you know, there's appropriate exercising and then there's not. Right. And and so within that not, <laughs> that encompasses heterosexual and homosexual, you know, and so there's limits. And, and so if you really want to look at it that way, then God, when he's saying, here's my limits, then it's 
relatively small, I guess. So from the response of the homosexuals, I had similar conversations is that for us, it's a not for them. It's a never. Yeah. And, and so they, they feel that reasonably much. more deeply, right? Yeah. Because it's not, okay. It's not a not now. Yeah. It's a not ever. Yeah. And, you know, and I had that conversation. I was like, that's right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any way of softening that. Mm-hmm. That is, that is true. And that is reality. So it always comes back to, who am I going to honor? Who am I going to serve? What's my life going to be about? Is it going to be about, you know, giving into this passion, whether, you know, it's regardless of what I think or feel about it, or is it going to be about being passionate about God? I mean, which means I might not be fulfilled in some other fleshly way. That's the reality for all of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, there's some things that, you know, we will never experience by way of the world experiences because we've chosen to serve God. And I realize there's, for, for some, that, that loss is going to be deeper. I get that. I mean, I don't know how to soften that, but that's the reality, that the loss will be deeper for some than, than others. But uh, I also think the the glory that God receives from it is also heightened. That obviously, the more we sacrifice for God, the the more glorious it is for Him, mm-hmm. and uh, the more glory He receives from that. And so they have a unique reality to choose God in a way deeper than perhaps I ever will. Yeah. Well, and there's other situations too. Um, I don't want to go too far off, but all throughout scripture, we never see a case where somebody that's remarried, that that is actually, um, you know, every time when somebody is remarried, then it says that they've committed adultery. And so if you've been divorced, whether it's your fault or not, then you'd have to make an argument to say that it's okay for me to remarry and not be an adulterer. And so for the people, if we go into marriage thinking the only way for me to get out of this marriage, if, if I'm going to be ever to be divorced, is to live celibate. Celibate, rest your life. That's a high, hard <laughs> calling, too. I mean, especially yeah. for people that are young, yeah. you know, and they're divorced and they're like, wait, you're telling me that I have to go for the next 50 years of my life, potentially, without ever being married again and never having another companion and all that type of stuff? I mean, from what we see in that's Scripture. the best understanding of what we see. That's what I see. That's what I see too. There is you can you can make some argument for divorce on a rare occasion, but you can never make the argument for marriage. Yeah, and that right. is a very hard thing. And so, I mean, obviously, when you look around at our church or any other church in, in America, especially, I can't speak for other ones, but man, I mean, you look around, and I mean, we're all banking on grace, boy. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So it brings us back to chapter two. We have no room to judge. Because we've all got something. I've, I've actually did a whole sermon on this. Love the sinner, hate your own sin. It, uh, <clears throat> we, we tend to want to hate other people's sin. No, you got. We got plenty of our own baggage that we can hate for a long time and be just fine. I wrote down judgmental criticism of others is a well-known way of escaping detection of your own crimes. Mm. You wrote that? I didn't steal. I stole it. Dang, oh. I didn't. I wrote it down <laughs> yes. for sure. Did you sign it? <laughs> let's let's dumb this down for, for whoever might need it. It was good. I like Thou it. doth protest too much. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I like verse four because he kind of brings it back to here's the reality. If we are that judgmental person, it's like it's maybe we have forgotten what we've been saved from and how mm, bad yeah. we are. It's like, oh, well, yeah. you got contempt for the wealth of kindness that's been shown to you. How can you not show kindness to others? Yeah, um, and just the fact that don't you know that God's kindness leads you to repentance? Yes. That that is the whole point. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, Paul, I like, I mean, it's it, he does a masterful job, obviously, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit of setting all these dominoes up. Like, hey, here's how bad we are. And uh, before you think your neighbor's worse than you, he's not. (laughs) Mm. And we all are in need of the same amount of grace, regardless of our failures and our falls. And so he spends the next few verses telling us just about how bad we are. (laughs) Yeah, storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of wrath. When God's righteous judgment is revealed, he will reward each one according to his works. What about verse 7, eternal life to those who by perseverance and good works seek glory and honor and immortality, Mm. but wrath and anger for those who live in selfish ambition. Yeah, if we just take that out of context of the book, that could yeah. be very misleading. Kind of. Yeah, <laughs> like all right, work hard, I, be good. <laughs> I wrote down eternal life <clears throat> to those whose faith leads to doing good versus yes. eternal wrath to those who obey unrighteousness. Um, mm-hmm. And it's no matter Jew or Greek. At this point, we don't trust anything you wrote. Okay, you stole, well, I did write that. <laughs> you stole all of it. I, I actually wrote that <laughs> okay, one because right. the other one was in quotation marks. <laughs> uh, 
You just no, forgot you, to put the quotation marks. But, no. you, but you are on it. And that, that really is obviously what Paul is saying. It's not that you know we work hard to be good. It's that uh, we are good because we have submitted and become obedient to faith. And, and it's the outflowing of that. Well, and it also brings up the fact that like when we say, because on, on a first initial reaction, when we see seek glory and honor in immortality, we would think, oh, well, that's, that's not the right pursuit. It's like mm-hmm. that. But we understand it within the context of that this is all found in God. It's found in faith in God. And, and so when we seek glory, we really are understanding that we're seeking the glory of God. We're not mm-hmm. seeking our own glory other than the fact that we get to share in the glory of God. Right as we'll see as we go through these epistles especially, but um, also honor, you know, that, that any honor that we have is only within right. Christ and the immortality that we have. We don't seek it in our own power. We understand that the immortality comes only in God, only in Christ. And so, again, it's that, it's that we're, who we trust on. In verse 8, he puts it, you know, do not, the, you know, the anger and, and wrath for those who do not obey the truth. And we go all the way back to verse 5 to understand that, that, that obedience of truth is faith. And so mm. believing yep. him, mm. um, he starts hinting at no partiality yep. as he mentions later on more in more detail. But um, in verse 11, he talks about how there's no partiality with God. All have sinned apart from the law. All also perish apart from the law. So this uh, this discourse is beneficial both for the Jew and the Gentile, but only because the Gentile has been a little bit corrupted by some improper thinking from Jewish people mm. as far as what the, the law's role is. Right. And, uh, and so he's, he's starting to clear some of that up. And basically the conclusion is it doesn't matter. You had the law, you broke it. You didn't have the law, you still broke it. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. you, you're all equally under <clears throat> wrath. Well, and if you didn't have the law and yet your, you know, your conscience told you that to do some things that were the law, then that even just confirms the law. Yes. So that the right. law was the standard and nobody here is meeting it. Yep. My outline for chapter two is all are, equally, all are equally condemned. We have no room for judgment. There's no advantage by heritage or nationality, and you can't argue your way out of it. And that's it. We move to chapter three now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't have anything else so really to add I, to that. <laughs> I do want to add and, and at least highlight verse 24. The name of God is being blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And just the fact that I think as... We as believers, you know, if we're claiming the name of Christ, we need to live in a manner worthy of the calling. Mm. As Christians, whatever it may be that we struggle with, let that be part of our motivation too, that we don't bring a bad name to among non-believers, basically. Um, it's, it's convicting for us. And then also yeah. in verse 25, and as we move on into chapter 3, just that whole idea of circumcision, and when he mentions into that, um, it's very clear Paul does not beat around the bush. Um, circumcision only has value when it's circumcision of the heart as opposed right. to the physical. The physical doesn't show anything. And he's like, you know, even Abraham. <laughs> when was he justified by his faith? Before or after he was circumcised? Right. We're moving into chapter 3. So who wants to take it? I just was, you know, I think it's interesting that he, you know, pulls out this whole circumcision argument. And then he's like, so what advantages do you have? Well, they do have an advantage. You know, they have the entrusted word of God. And, you know, they also had the promise of the covenant through their circumcision, you know, so there's that. But, you know, later on, it it turns out that they couldn't keep the law. The law just showed them that they needed, you know, saving from their sin. So I love how Paul in chapter three precludes the argument by just making the argument. So let's just, yeah. go, ahead, let's just go ahead and cover this. <laughs> so somebody, some weird dude he out does, there somewhere yeah. is going to ask this question. So let's just go Verse ahead. Verse five. And it. Yeah. So it's <laughs> yeah. like, you know, if. For if our being bad, you know, shows that God is good, you know, why don't we just continue to be bad? And why are we judged for it? You know, if it all ultimately and he's and like, let's be honest, we we would all kind of like that. Yeah, if that were true, right. yeah. just live our life and be like, isn't yeah. God gracious? Yes, yeah, so it's like he's so good. <laughs> uh, but uh, he kind of puts the kibosh on that. It's like that is not accurate thinking. Absolutely not. God is true. Every man's a liar. That's not how it works. And and he says that several times. It's not the only time. And why should we continue in sin that grace may abound? We'll yeah, see that a little bit later. Right. right. And yeah. it's like, no, that's that's flawed thinking, people. And that's the logic of man, though. He continues to point it out. That's that's where our natural logic goes because we have this logic that God has given us. But although we have it, it is flawed. And so even though for us, even sitting here, we say, well, that's that's logical. You know, Paul's making a logical argument, and yet he's saying it's not biblical. Yeah. And so it's uh, so the logic of man cannot be trusted. Let's start with that. 
Yeah. Um, and yeah, for sure. It is beautiful to say, okay, well, you know, the faithfulness of God is seen even more in our unfaithfulness. Right. But that's, that's not what we're striving for. <laughs> right. And he also brings up the point, is God wrong then for wrath? And the answer, you know, is absolutely not. You know, he's not right. wrong for inflicting wrath on us for being unfaithful, um, even though it brings his, him glory. Yeah. He's not wrong in that. So let's don't let's don't say do more evil so more good can come. <laughs> yeah. As some slander us allege that we say. Yeah. So Paul said, know, he's that, saying, I've already heard this. <laughs> I think people are still using that today. Hmm. I have I've heard it a little bit. Wow. Are you talking about like people that we would label as pharisaical, like legalistic or Yeah, I would say there I mean there's some denominations that are stricter than us in the way that they live life. Mostly fundamental Baptists, <laughs> <laughs> and or any of and, such were some of you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and so yeah, it's kind of that you know looking looking in and being like you guys are just you know using scripture to to sin all you want. All oh, right, yeah. There there is some cultures within the Christian faith, and I'll I'll add them as the Christian faith at least yeah. as far as you know the gospel's right and true, and but there are they've created cultures of judgmentalism where it, everybody outside of their church basically is doing something wrong. Yeah. And and I know people like that. <laughs> this is unfortunate. And so how do you deal with that? I just, we show grace. That's mm-hmm. how we deal with it. Mm-hmm. And we've got, you know, friends that are part of that culture. Like, you know, you show grace. You, you do what's right by God and just show grace. And, you know, God will bring them where he wants them to be in due time. I, I try to even avoid looking at it as the weaker brother just because there's things that they're doing that uh, are probably more strict that I should be more strict in. Right. Uh, I don't agree sometimes with the culture of judgmentalism or it, it really boils down to a culture of man worship if you're not real careful because I'm doing this because, you know, I don't want to be seen as not doing it by somebody else or I'm not doing that because I don't want to be seen as doing it by somebody else. Not because mm-hmm. I have some strong moral conviction about it, but just because I'm afraid of being talked about by a culture that talks about people. There. There it is. That's it. (laughs) That's what it is. So coming in verse 9, are we better off? Certainly not, for we have already charged the Jews and the Gentiles are alike under sin. So everybody is guilty. Uh, No one understands. No one sees. It's the X-28 kind of Isaiah passage. It's um, all this. And, And this is one of the things that this is where I get, you know, at least personally, a lot of my theology in terms of just the depravity of man. You know, again, we would like to think that we're good and we would like to think that we've got some natural understanding. And even that whole idea of in chapter one, when, you know, God has revealed himself. And and so we have these concepts or we seek God ourselves or something. That's not the case. Mm -mm. We are certainly blinded. We are certainly ones that do not understand. There's no one who seeks God and we've all been condemned. We're all guilty. And so we need to understand that that's our foundation. Yeah, dead in the trespasses of sin. Mm -hmm. I wrote down, verse 19 says that, you know, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced or that every mouth um, will be shut and the whole world may be held accountable to God. So I wrote down, so far we've we've seen there's no excuse for ignoring God. There's no excuse for hypocritical judgment. And then lastly, there's no excuse for breaking the law. Mm -hmm. And that's my other three-part sermon. And by law, you mean God's law. Right. Yes. Breaking, yeah, the law. Yeah, the, <laughs> capital T. The, yeah. <laughs> well, and I love how this harkens back to so many different things. We already mentioned uh, Acts 28 and, and the Isaiah passage, but also um, chapter 1 when, you know, again, things that are worthless altogether, they've turned away and, and become worthless. Uh, there's no one who shows kindness, not even one. And then that whole mouth's being silent. This is where I feel like he's coming from as our throats are open graves. We mm. see people with our tongues where poison of asp is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursings and bitterness, swift to shed blood and all that type of stuff. It's that it's the behavior that comes, you know, our mouth. Like if we think of where what shows our heart, Scripture tells us that it is what comes out of our mouth right. primarily. But I would also add, and I think, you know, you can make scriptural support to it as well. But clearly our, our behavior does mm. the same. And so when we're seeing this and we're seeing all that Paul is mentioning here in 11 or 10 through 18, then we are certainly condemning ourselves and we're certainly seeing ourselves as going back to that worthless aspect. And so when he says 
every mouth is going to be silenced, we're not able to make our own defense. You know, we we stand before a judge and we're speechless. Right. We can't we can't defend. Yeah. And from the beginning of chapter two, he's been building a case all the way to verse twenty three and twenty four. Right. Mm-hmm. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. We've all gotten it wrong in various and manifold ways. Yeah. But. And I love the butts. Mm, I know. We, yes. we don't often do oh, verse 24, right? I know. We, we should memorize that one just as, just as well as 23. But there's justification freely by his grace. Again, mm-hmm. and this puts everything back into perspective. It's not because of works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his grace that he saves us. And redemption, we're redeemed, we're brought back, we're made right. That is in Christ Jesus. Yeah. And I love 21, too, as far as now, apart from the law, righteousness of God. Um, is manifested uh, in Christ. And so it's, we were hopeless before. And it's it's constantly seeing that hopelessness. If it were only for the law, we would be utterly hopeless. We'd be utterly right. condemned. But the hope has been made manifest and the righteousness apart from the law has been, has been brought in yeah. the person of Jesus. I wrote down 1 Corinthians 5.12 that, um, just talking about Jesus, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. So now that we can be declared righteous or justified through the person of Jesus in verse 22, it says, Jesus. yeah, namely the righteousness of God through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Or if you had an older translation through the faith of faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. I looked at that, you know, translation thing, faithfulness of Jesus Christ or faith in Jesus Christ. They said in the NET, they were like, this is kind of hard (laughs) (laughs) because it changes the meaning. Um, You know, we know that. And Paul teaches us several times throughout his epistles that justification is through faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But this could be talking about the faithfulness of Jesus Christ to the will of the father and his pursuit of cleansing sin. So it it, it could be either. (laughs) Both versions are true. They are. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's no... No risk here. That's why I wrote right. 1 Corinthians 5.12 down, because it, it reminded me of that. Jesus' faithfulness of becoming sin to the point of death. You know, and then getting continuing forward uh, again, for because we were all equally doomed, and we've all equally needed grace, then verse 27, there there is no boasting. Mm. I mean, just... And particularly even in that society, obviously the Jews thought they were better than everybody else. Yeah. I mean, we, this is... Not even for discussion. We realize that whether they would have admitted it or not. It, uh, and I, that's the tendency for everybody, right? Every group, every sect, every nation, you know, has some degree of, hey, we're better. And that's why we continue to have so war- many wars and fights, even within communities or within churches. There's, you know, there's usually some idea that, you know, I'm right and you're wrong. It, and so Paul's kind of putting it all on equal footing. No, you're all wrong. And that's why you all had to have grace. And so there is no boasting. You're not better. Well, and what's beautiful, too, is that uh, there's this... I'm trying to see if it actually mentioned it. But anyway, there's at least an allusion to if if I missed it, you guys can help me out maybe. But uh, just the whole idea of the mercy seat being, oh, yeah. you know, that, that when we're talking... Okay, I thought I was in there. This whole idea of, of the law being within the the ark... And mm-hmm. that's what they saw. And the mercy seat of, of God, you know, that that when you approach the Holy of Holies, that the, the law of God is in there. It's in the Ark of the Covenant. And this is the presence of God. But then, you know, just that whole beauty. We talked about the, the tearing of the veil. But just the idea that it's not when you have the mercy seat of God over the law, we're not looking to the law. We're looking to the mercy of God. Right. You know, we're looking to the fact that we have been condemned, but we're looking for God's mercy. You know, the grace that God has given to show us love and all that type of stuff. But really, it's the mercy that goes hand in hand with that, mm-hmm. that that is what we are seeking. And that whole propitiation idea of, of Christ becoming, you know, him taking our place and, and fulfilling the the requirement of the law and the wrath of God. I made a note, too, about verse 25, about God and his forbearance or I think the CSB said God in his restraint or he had restraint and allowed Jesus to take care of, you know, sins at this time that, that shows that this was the plan the whole time. Mm-hmm. The law was never the whole plan. Yeah. Um, you know, it wasn't just that you either have to do the whole law and you're, and you're saved or you're not. No, Jesus. And like what you said with the mercy seat being over the law, that 
that was the way it was designed so that this was the plan. Yeah. And so now we come into a law of faith and, uh, in chapter four, and as we go on, as we move into that, it, we're going to see a little bit of a shift, um, you know, further description and everything. But it's a good, good way to, um, I guess, pause and understand. It's the the law of faith is is it's not getting rid of the law. It's not saying, okay, well, we can do whatever we want because we're under grace and freedom and all of it. And so, you know, God can show His mercy and praise God for His faithfulness. Yeah. But that when we are under faith, then we are seeing the truth and the truth, understanding the truth sets us free and all that. But, you know, that we live under a a law of faith. And that is actually a higher standard than the law itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah.